As I mentioned, we are going to look into the subject of biblical prophecy, particularly just how are things that are going on in the world today perhaps related to what the Bible says about future events. A number of you have uh, asked about this subject since uh, things have changed and uh, some major things are going on, not only in our country, but in the world. And naturally, as believers in Jesus Christ and believers in the word of God, uh, we are interested. Uh, does the Bible say anything about these matters? So I think a good place for us to start is with our well-known chart. So if you put that chart up, it's called the 70 Weeks Chart. It is the overview of biblical prophecy as set down, particularly the book of Daniel chapter 9. On 70 weeks are determined upon God's people Israel, the nation Jerusalem, and so on, to accomplish God's purposes. So that's where the 70 weeks, there are 70 weeks of years, literally 77s. Um, the um, first 69 have occurred. You can see, I believe this is on your computers if you uh, have them available. Uh, ended with the death of Christ. Shortly after the 69th week, the book of Daniel tells us that Christ would be crucified. And uh, he was, he was raised from the dead. Then there is a break between the 69th and the 70th week. That last seven year period uh, follows the church age. We live in this period called the church age. And the church age will culminate with what we call the rapture of the church. The Greek word is harpizo, which means to snatch or catch up. Uh, we get rapture from the Latin uh, word and uh, means to be caught up. We'll be caught up to meet Christ in the air. All true believers, those who have died during this period of time, their bodies will be resurrected right here and transformed into a glorified body suitable for God's presence. Um, then all those who are alive and have their faith in Jesus Christ will be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. And you'll note this arrow goes back up. Christ does not come to earth. He takes these to heaven. Remember John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That event then is followed. There'll be an agreement signed between the leader of the Western nations, a revived Roman Empire, and that will mark this last seven-year period, which will culminate with Christ coming to earth. And when he comes to earth, he says, every eye will see him. Uh, they'll recognize that he is the one coming to take uh, vengeance on his enemies and to establish a kingdom. And he'll establish a kingdom that begins with judgment and goes on, beginning with a thousand years and into eternity. When we're looking at what the Bible says about prophecy, the next event is the rapture of the church. There are no details on the earth that are preliminary to that. Uh, what we do is look and see what the Bible says about this seven-year period and gives us some detail. The book of Revelation from chapter 6 to 19 is about this seven-year period as well as other portions of Scripture. So we want to be careful. Not saying that the events that we're going to talk about are the exact fulfillment of biblical prophecy. What we are saying is what God has said is going to be taking place after the church is raptured to heaven. We may see events that are foreboding of that. At least help us see how that could come, to, come about and come to take place. So we'll just talk about some of those things. Important to begin with the sovereignty of God over all things. How do we know these things will happen? I mean, how can we be sure? 
of future events, whether it's the rapture of the church or the events that follow. It's because God is sovereign over all. If you have your Bibles handy, you can turn to the book of Isaiah, if you would. We're just going to look at one or two verses since we have looked at this in its own study, God's sovereignty over all, both the good and the evil. And you could uh, get that on the website if uh, you want to uh, go back and refresh your mind on that. Um, Book Isaiah chapter 45, for example. Isaiah chapter 45. Um, Look at verse um, 5. I am the Lord, there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. Um, And he reminds them, even though you don't know him, he's still in control and sovereignty working. Um, He's addressing Israel here in their rebellion. But the opposition of man, the rebellion of man does not frustrate God's plan. Um, Verse 6, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness causing well-being and causing calamity. You don't know, it doesn't matter what is going on, God is sovereignly in control of it, bringing about what he will. That doesn't mean he causes sin, but he uses even the rebellion of sinful people to accomplish his plan. I am the Lord who does all these things. And the catastrophes... The disasters, what are known as natural events, what the world sometimes talks about as mother nature, uh, which is really an expression of the denial of the sovereignty of uh, God who rules over all. Uh, The viruses, the tornadoes, the fires, uh, the calamities uh, are all done as well as the things we would call good things. Um, people like to think of God only do, having providing good things, but who's, what's happening in the world? Um, verse 9 tells us, we better recognize this fact. Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker. An earthen well vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands. Um, we submit to God. We do not challenge God. I don't see why God would do that. I don't see the purpose in that. I don't have to. I recognize God is sovereignly working his purposes. Um, Down in verse 12, it is I who made the earth and created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hand. I ordained all their hosts. And just mauled a apply the passages that we have looked at on other occasions that remind us God is sovereign. That is an encouragement. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if God is your heavenly father, as we have studied in the book of Romans, he causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. The the disasters, sometimes we partake of them. Even if you're a child of God, We might get the virus, we get cancer, we are affected if there's a tornado. Um, Whatever happens can uh, impact us. But God is working, caring for his children, working even the difficulties that come into their life for his good purposes for them. For the world, it is an indication of coming judgment. So there's a purpose in it all. And these judgments are a reminder to the unbelieving world that God is serious about sin. There are consequences coming. Now be careful here. Sometimes every time you have a large-scale disaster, there's going to be some preachers who see an opportunity here to look as though they have special revelation from God. God is causing this virus because homosexuality because, and you fill in the blank with some, um, God is pouring out his wrath on an unbelieving world. 
And all these judgments are a reminder that he is a God of judgment. We won't take time to look at uh, those things. We've done that on other occasions as well. But just for an example that probably most of us are familiar with, the plagues on Egypt, those different disasters that came. Some of them, you know, you think, well, locusts, a swarm of locusts. We have locust swarms today. A reminder, in Egypt, God is pouring out his wrath on a people that will not bow the knee to him. So you have that series of disasters brought. Some seeming more supernatural, some seeming more natural. But all supernatural in the sense God was bringing them to manifest his judgment. And this is just a preview, if you will. And so as you go through the Old Testament, particularly the prophets, you see that again and again, where God reminds them, the Assyrians conquer the northern 10 tribes, but God reminds them, it is judgment for your rebellion against me. So that's true for the world at large. Uh, It's a reminder. Uh, It prepares us as believers it reminds us that the world is moving toward judgment. Because, you know, we can get lax, get comfortable. You know, last year at this time, we were just thought we were a prosperous country. Things were getting better. Business is good. Uh, stock market looks good. Um, you know, these are just good days to enjoy things. Not that everybody was happy with things, but... You know, basically, things seem to be going along. You'd have never thought that uh, in a short time, everything would turn around. And uh, businesses would be lost. uh, Money would be lost. Health would be lost. Freedom would be lost. And things change rapidly. A reminder to us as believers where we are ultimately going. Why don't you come over to 2 Peter chapter 3. All the way almost to the end of your Bible. You go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Then you just come forward through those shorter epistles uh, there, Jude and 1 John, 2 and 3 John. But you come to 1 and 2 Peter. 2 Peter. And in chapter 3, look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord, and that's talking about that seven-year period that will happen after the rapture of the church, will come like a thief in the night, or like a thief here, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God when all these things will be destroyed. But we're looking for the new heavens and the new earth. And ultimately, it's where we get in Revelation 21 and 22. And when God's fullness of salvation is realized for all believers. And all believers have come under the judgment of God. So a good reminder for us as believers. When these things happen, not that we're glad when... Uh, People suffer, but realize the hand of God has a purpose in it. Um, It's a reminder. Things will get worse. All right. Um, Just arbitrarily picked out some things that uh, are going to take place. Yesterday, downloaded from a news site uh, from yesterday where it, they, it, uh, they marked the annual Europe Day. And uh, that's the day which would become the European Union eventually, but this was the preliminary foundation. Uh, the president of Turkey was speaking on Saturday, marked the annual Europe Day, saying the European Union would come out of its current p- pandemic-induced crisis stronger with the right, right and timely steps. Europe Day, known as the Schuman Day, is observed on May 9th each year to mark the Schuman Declaration in 1950 that proposed the formation of a European coal and steel community, the predecessor to the European Union. 
Now that formal union didn't happen until I believe about 1992. But you see, uh, going back, it was 70 years. The foundation was laid for a European Union. And uh, this uh, president of Turkey says, I believe that better days will be with us when the language of discrimination and hatred is cast aside, when the common interest of our Europe is not sacrificed for uh, petty political games or national interest, when we are inclusive and just, and so on. Looking for that union. Uh, come to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Just a reminder. And a couple of things come together. Bible talks about there will be a revived Roman Empire. We'll go to Daniel chapter 2 and then we'll go to Daniel uh, chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 2, um, talks about the final form of world empire. It's going to be a revival of the Roman Empire. And out of that will arise a man to be the dictator and the ruler who will start within that and become the ruler of that revived empire which will ultimately develop into a worldwide empire which is Satan's counterfeit of the, you will, an attempt to replace God's prophesied kingdom over which Christ will rule. So that man is known as the Antichrist, uh, opposing the work of God. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel's giving the explanation of a dream that was given to a pagan Gentile ruler, the king of Babylon. We're familiar with him, Nebuchadnezzar. And the image was of a statue of a man. And each part of the man is made of different metals. And each part represents another world empire. So verse 32 of Daniel 2, we're not going to go into the details. You can uh, find those when we did more detailed study like of the book of Daniel. The head of that statue was made of fine gold. Then you see the chest and arms are of silver, the belly, thighs, the legs of iron, the feet partly of iron, partly of clay. Then a stone comes into the picture and smashes the whole image. And that stone grows into an empire. And it's explained by Daniel as God makes it known to him. Uh, verse 37, you, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and so on. The end of verse 38, you are the head of gold. So the Babylonian empire under Nebuchadnezzar at its peak, uh, that's the head of gold, that empire. Then you'll come down, verse 39, after you there'll be another kingdom, inferior. Then a third kingdom of bronze, which will be over all the earth. Then the fourth kingdom, as strong as iron, and that brings us to Rome. And it will shatter all things in recognition just in world empires of the power and might and crushing uh, victories of Rome to rule the world. And then verse 41, saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay, partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom. It will have in it the toughness of iron and the weakness, the brittleness of clay. Uh, so verse 42, those toes, how many toes on an image? The man, the image, 10 toes. Um, we'll see that in another passage in a moment. In the days of those kings, verse 44, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. No other kingdom to follow. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. It will endure forever. So what we see going on in the world, we don't want to lose perspective. I know they've gone through some turmoil in the European Union. Um, if that's not... Uh, what is uh, leading the way, it'll be something like that. 
Uh, saying the European Union is the fulfillment of this, and there are, what, 27 nations in that right now. Uh, but things adjust, and I know there were 28, and England leaves, but uh, you see how that there is a desire to revive that, and even in this statement put out yesterday in celebration of uh, this foundational uh, agreement in 1950, that led to an ultimate union on a much broader scale. Um, who knows what comes next, but the Bible indicates there will be this revived empire. Ten nations come over to Daniel chapter uh, 7. Daniel is given this vision. It was given to Nebuchadnezzar a Gentile because this is for, you know, a lot of this involves world empires, not just Israel. The culminating empire will be a Jewish empire, but it will encompass all nations. But Daniel now is given a vision in chapter 7, and he sees the same information but with different pictures. Now each empire is pictured as a wild beast. Verse 4, the first was like a lion. There's four beasts coming up. They'll parallel the four empires uh, of uh, chapter 2. Uh, the first was like a lion. And then a second beast, like a bear. And then a third. And then a fourth. And then you come to uh, the fourth beast down in verse 7 to the detailed discussions of the preceding three. Looking in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying. Remember the fourth empire was like iron, smashing everything, overpowering everything. So now it's pictured as a beast, but it's dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. It had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And in that sense, it was different from all the rest. And note the last statement. It had ten horns. Remember the ten toes? Now here you have ten horns. Now we get more detail here. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. Three of the first horns were pulled up by the roots before it. So he comes up among the ten. Now important to note that. I wonder where will the Antichrist come from? Well, I take it he comes from the revived Roman Empire. Um, so that would seem to put it outside our bounds. Um, but he arises and he becomes the dominant figure. And he is the last ruler of his kind. And he's the most powerful We'll look at another passage on that. But you'll note, I kept looking, verse 9, until thrones were set up, the Ancient of Days took his seat, and the picture of God the Father sitting on his throne, uh, thousands upon thousands, myriads upon myriads, standing before him. And there's judgment. And then in verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man. Remember Jesus' favorite name for himself when he was on earth was son of man. Coming, he came to the ancient of days, presented before him to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And you'll note, it's in the line of these earthly empires. We take the Bible literally, consistently literally. It doesn't mean they're not figures of speech and so on, but we don't move from interpreting it in a normal, literal way when we come to prophecy. You see the details God gives here. And this is an empire replacing other empires. It's not uh, just a spiritual empire that exists in the hearts of people. As some teach today, some of you come from Roman Catholic or Lutheran kinds of backgrounds with uh, another Reformed backgrounds who do not take a literal interpretation of prophetic passages. It's very clear. These earthly empires, they just won't gradually 
you know, disappear as God's people become stronger or whatever view. Um, it will become with smashing power and he will take over all the other empires. Remember chapter two, that stone, the crushed empires. That'll be pictured in Revelation 19 at the battle of Armageddon when Christ descends in the clouds as uh, you have it in verse 13 of Daniel 7. Uh, Behold, with the clouds of heaven, like one like a son of man was coming. Uh, that's what will happen in Revelation 19. It's talked about in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, so you get a picture now. We've come through the Roman Empire. But remember, it's going to be revived. There are elements still in existence. We have the Roman Catholic Church. Um, we have certain things that continue, but as an empire, it will be revived. And there'll be 10 nations ultimately solidified and put together that uh, rule. And then one man will come out of that. Um, come over to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. And the chapter opens up where John sees a beast coming out of the sea having ten horns and seven heads. And uh, he's going back. Daniel picks up with where he is. And the empire in existence when Daniel was prophesying was Babylon. And remember... Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, you are the head of gold. You're this first empire we're talking about, the Babylonian empire. Um, John, in his revelation, God reveals to him, takes him back to the beginning of these empires, which uh, precede um, the empires that preceded Babylon. Uh, which the first empire that impacts Israel as a nation is what? Egypt. So we'll come out from there and Assyria and so on. Now here, uh, he's got seven and you'll note here, uh, 10 horns, seven heads. So he's got the seven heads, the 10 horns we're familiar with. We saw 10 horns before, seven heads. We saw the four empires and then the fifth, which is the 10 horns, because out of, uh, you know, you'll have Egypt, Assyria, then the four empires, then you have the 10 horns, that makes six, and then the seventh will be that Antichrist himself. So you had Egypt, Assyria, then you pick up with Babylon, down to Rome. Then we have a break. Then we pick up with the next empire. It's 10 nations federated together to make a kingdom ruling. Then out of that uh, 10 horns we saw, there arise a little horn, Daniel 7. Here, I saw a beast coming out of the sea having 10 horns and seven heads. And the 10 horns will be on that seventh head, which was the fourth animal because Daniel did not include Egypt and Assyria. So then you have six, the seven heads, uh, this will be the seventh, uh, the ten horns, uh, the final kingdom. And then on his horns were ten diadems. So these last ten kings become the focus here. This is what he's interested in. This last form of world empire. These ten horns have diadems. The diadem is the Greek count, crown of a ruler, a king. A Stephanos uh, is the crown of a victor. Uh, someone has a victory like in a, their uh, athletic contests. Um, so the diadem, these are rulers, 10 horns, 10 diadems. On his heads were blasphemous names because the, this is the kingdom of Satan in his fuller manifestation. The end of verse two, the dragon gave him his power, throne and great authority. 
And we're told back in chapter 12, verse 9, that the dragon is also called the devil and Satan. So there's no doubt about the power. It's a supernatural kingdom. It comes from the spirit world, but it's empowered and enabled by the devil. Here pictured as the dragon. Then I saw one of his heads as have been slain and his fatal wound was healed. And this would seem to fit. Remember what we saw? Out from among the ten, there's going to arise a little horn. And he places three, so he becomes the dominant figure. So he's in a place to become the world dictator. And one of his heads had been slain. His fatal wound was healed and the whole world followed after him. May indicate a counterfeit of the resurrection of Christ. Um, but... Uh, we can go into the details when we studied it here. There's a mouth given to him speaking arrogant words, blasphemies, authority to act for 42 months. So for the first three and a half years, 42 months, three and a half years, the 10 nations are dominant. For the last three and a half years of that seven year period, this uh, Antichrist, as we familiarly know him, is ruling. He speaks mat blaspheme, Femi blasphemes against uh, God. Um, he makes war with the saints in verse 7. Um, this is God's judgment on an unbelieving world. Um, but it also is a chastening of his people. Uh, and it's a preparation. Uh, and he'll cause the world to worship him. And we're familiar often with the number 666. And that comes from the closing verses of chapter 13. Verse 16, he causes all the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. He provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here's wisdom. Let him one has understanding. The number of the beast is 666. I don't think that we'll, we've got that deciphered. Come say, well, six is the number of man. Uh, in completion, seven's a number. But I think it will become clear in that seven-year period, the people of God will recognize in light of revelation what is required here and the allegiance to this man and the worship of him. I just wonder, how does this fit? Well, interesting as I've watched what happens unfolds in the world, and you have too, and some of you have talked about it. Um, how quickly things could change. You know, it used to be, well, how would that happen? And everybody's going to just do what this man says. But look what's happened in the world. Look what's happened in our country. You didn't think six months ago that you would give up all your freedoms. That we would be told you cannot come to church and gather. That your business is shut down until further notice. But wait, I put my money into that business. I put blood, sweat, and tears into it. I've invested everything I have. Yes. And I closed it. Who? Who? Governing authority says it's closed. Wait, I have constitutional rights. No, you don't. Those have all been absolved because we are in a uh, panic. Now, I'm not disagreeing whether this was necessary or not. That was my decision. But you see how it can happen. Things that we puzzled and wondered, well, people would never put up with that. Uh, the government couldn't just come in and take away my business. Well, they don't formally take it away. They just shut it down. And can you survive? Um, and then we'll give you money to live. Well, you know, the hand that gives can take away. And you see, pretty soon, you know, you're told what you can buy and what you can't buy. You go to the store and have a sign. You can buy one of these. You cannot buy more than one. We happened to go through and I didn't know that the sign applied to that. And the computer wouldn't take it. And then the person watching the, I was going to say guarding the registers, but watching comes over and says, I'm sorry, you have two of those. You can only take one. I say, my, how things change. It wasn't that long ago. We just went down. And if you wanted 20 boxes of one cereal, go ahead, buy it. Eat stale cereal. Nobody cares. But all of a sudden, no, you can't buy. We'll tell you what you can buy. We'll tell you when you can go in the store. In fact, some stores you have to wait outside until... You go in and they allow a certain number to go in. And of course, you have to be 
you know, have your mask, you have to be checked. Well, maybe they'll be checking people that have had the vaccine and, you know, if you don't have the number, uh, you can't buy or sell. All we see is, again, I'm not attacking what's going on because I don't have an answer. So you see what happens in the world, God's sovereign. Uh, Will the Antichrist be able to take control? I mean, for the first three and a half years, he's the savior of Israel. And he has been good. I read you the article from Time Magazine. I think it was back in the 1980s. It's still in my file. Where the leaders of that union coming together said, if there is a man who could pull us together in union, we would follow him if he was the devil himself. Well, you will get what you want. Uh, He's coming. So you just see, I look at things going on and I say, my, it's amazing. They tell you when you can leave your house. I'm one of those elderly, old, vulnerable people. Um, I appreciate they are acting to protect me, but maybe I want to go out of my house. We'll tell you when you can go out of your house. We're protecting you. Reminds me when I've been in communist countries. They were protecting us. You know, they watched everywhere you went, what you did. They told you who you could see and who you couldn't, where you could go and where you couldn't. The taxi driver couldn't take us where we wanted to go. When as American visitors, we wanted to go to the zoo, they got approval for the taxi driver to take us there. He sat there for hours until we came out to be sure we didn't get a ride anywhere else. So it happens and we look around and say, that couldn't happen in our country. We have the constitution, we have rights and overnight they're all gone. Again, I'm not attacking the government. I don't know what the answer to is in a pandemic. In fact, there will be no answers because God's plan is unfolded. This is where we're going. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow because the rapture hasn't happened yet. So we may come out of this. But we as believers at least ought to have had our eyes and ears sharpened that, you know, I could see how that could happen very quickly. Who would have thought? The church is in town. Are they meeting today? Well, first they told us we could meet today. And you look around, there are three or four of you sitting here. There are tapes blocking off seats all over because at first they told us how you would have to sit where you could sit and there could be no nursery there could be no children's they have to stay with their parents and only families could be uh close and then everybody else has oh fine you go through all that you tape it all off you do all this but this week they decided there are more to add to that well so we could say well we're going to go out we're going to try to do that and this and we had to be sure that we were going to tell you could only leave row at a time, be sure everybody knows they cannot stop and talk to each other. Who would have thought we would come to that? You know, there have been last year at this time, we say, nobody's going to tell me who I can talk to. I can talk to who I want. If I want to go out of my house and walk down the street, I'll do it. And if we're going to meet at church, we'll meet at church. Um, no. And now there are more. And I'm not saying they won't all loosen up and this virus will pass, but a reminder God can shut down the world pretty quickly. What if uh, we have to move on? You know, these are all preliminary judgments. God is a God of love. He offers his salvation. But remember, the world is ripening for judgment. Uh, We're going to come back to Revelation. Uh, Leave your napkin. You're at home. You don't have a bulletin. You're probably drinking coffee or having breakfast. Leave something in Revelation. Come back to Genesis 15. Genesis 15, it is there. I had my Bible rebound. It takes me a little to get that part flattened out. Um, Remember God told Abraham that he was going to give the land of Canaan, populated by the Canaanites, to Abraham's descendants. But it won't be for 400 years. Why? He tells Abraham in verse 15, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you'll be buried. 
Then in the fourth generation, they'll return here for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. You see what's going on in these years. The land of Canaan is ripening for judgment. They thought, you know, they go, the years go by, God's not doing anything. But he was. He was letting them like fruit ripen. What a picture. So it's ready. This is what the world is doing. It is ripening for judgment. On your way back to Revelation, stop at the book of Romans, which we are studying together in chapter 2. If they're talking about the sins, and you know, God lumps them all together because at the root of all sin is rebellion against God. I just want to be careful. People say, oh, this, this virus is happening because of this sin. And, oh, well, he's a preacher. He ought to know. He doesn't know. He doesn't know any more than anybody else knows. Only what the word of God says. Sin will bring it because it is all a manifestation of the rejection of God. They have rejected him. That's where the judgments begin with uh, chapter 1, of verse 18 of Revelation. Uh, so when we come into chapter 2, there's no excuse. Then no, these things deserve judgment. You'll note verse 32. Although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, they give hearty approval. Doesn't mean everyone does every one of those, but there you see, sin is characteristic of the heart and mind that is against rebellion against God. Well, what's God going to do? I mean, they crucified Christ, yes, and we understand that was part of the provision, the foundational provision for God to be able to declare us righteous through faith in Christ. The men continue in their rebellion down through 2,000 years of time. What is happening? Well, we're building up judgment. Uh, verse three, verse two, do you not know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things? Do you suppose, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That's the pattern going on. Um, it just hasn't finally ripened for judgment yet. Um, how patient God is. Um, Peter answers this. People say, oh, nothing's happened. God hasn't judged us. He's patient, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of the truth. But try to present the truth in the world today. That's something you're not allowed to do. Keep it to yourself. Go down to the university. How many of the classes bring in? Here's what God has to say. Of course, well, we don't promote any religion. Uh, I understand that. But we don't allow you to do it either. Talk to a professor there. And his supervisor told him he shouldn't be talking to students about his religious beliefs. Well, why? Wait, wait a minute. I mean, the non-Christian professors, they're spewing their beliefs out all the time. That God didn't create the world. It just happened. Oh, you came from an ape or something else and... All these things go on. Well, it's all right to present those things that are contrary to what God says. The world is ripening for judgment. It seems we go so far and then it seems maybe there's a little bit of a break and then we go and it seems there's a progressive deterioration and it seems more obviously worldwide. I see China's cra cracking down on Christians with more arrests. When I was there many years ago, some of the pastors that I talked to who had been in prison and uh, served there 20 or 25 years, say, now they want us to register our churches and the people. I said, we know, we can't do that. It seems like a simple requirement, but all they're doing is making a list so they know who to go after when they're ready the next time. 
And now we see it. Even, uh, Christians are being arrested. They're disappearing. These things. Where's the world going? It's ripening for judgment. Now remember, the rapture's coming. Sometimes we as Christians are going on like the worst thing that's happened in our life is the virus. Well, you know, all these things are going to be burned up anyway. You know, if the rapture's going to happen tomorrow, I hope most of my treasure's not planted here. I mean, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's lasting. And it's not bad that we have houses to live in and that, but the mindset that draws me into those things is deadly. Uh, we have to be careful. What's, cool? What's the world doing while we're living as those who don't have much more spiritual insight? Uh, so we want to be careful and be alert and aware, but don't want to get ahead of God. Remember, Ecclesiastes reminded us, we cannot change the past and we cannot control the future. And believers that act like they know more than God has specifically revealed. I know that judgment is coming, not because I'm some kind of super spiritual man with insight. I've read what God says. But I only know as much as he has said. That's why I say, well, look at these things and I could see how this could be a possible way. But, you know, I didn't see that this would happen exactly like this either. But it's consistent. So all I can look at and say, come over to, your, I told you to go to Revelation. The problem with getting into these matters is they become a series of sermons. Uh, come to Revelation uh, Let's see, you're in chapter 13. Let me skip that page, that page. Um, let's start, go back to chapter six. We'll just pick up two passages. I, thought, I couldn't help but think of these passages and I have some others, but uh, you see what happens here. The judgments of that seven-year period begin in chapter six of Revelation. And we'll go through the first three and a half years of then we'll have the break to talk about the Antichrist and all of that. And then we'll finish out with the last three and a half years, the way the book of Revelation unfolds as we study it together. Here are a series of seals on a scroll. And when a seal is broken, a judgment comes out. And uh, you get to the fourth seal. And in that, the, a horse comes out bringing the judgment. Verse 8, I looked and behold an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had his name Death. Hades was following. Hades gathers in um, the souls of those who die. That's where they go. Uh, remember the rich man in Luke 16? Lifted up his eyes in Hades. He was tormented in that flame. And you'll note here, authority was given them over a fourth of the earth. So let's just say, so I can handle it. It's six billion people because I can divide four into six billion and get one and a half. Um, so we could have done four billion. But you get the idea of the number. Over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with famine, with pestilence, with wild beasts. You know, all kinds of things are going to come together. And one quarter of the earth. I mean... You know, we got a long way to go compared to what's going to happen in the tribulation when a billion, a billion and a half people are going to die under judgment. I mean, we're in panic for what's going on now around the world. Countries are shut down. They've, what if this was really deadly? Then what have you added to that a variety of kind? I see we've got the hornet coming in. Uh, they're trying to stop it. It's that big hornet, Asian hornet, that kills the bees and can kill humans. And, um, you, know, well, you know, we see locusts going on in the world, that part of the world. What do these things multiply coming together? Uh, you know, we used to think, well, a virus, like most of us, like I thought, well, this virus, it'll probably come now, all these great scientific minds and doctors will get together and we'll have a solution to that here in a few weeks and we can get on with life. 
um, some of our governing leaders were saying, get out, go to a restaurant, do these things. You know, it's not so bad. And it became badder, worse than we expected. Um, what if it was really bad? What if, you know, what if 25% of the population of Lincoln died just in this one? Um, you know, and you add to that, what if tornado blew through when we were trying to deal with that? And then we had a insect infection that we didn't know about. I mean, all of a sudden, how do your medical resources, which was the concern with this, which ends up being minor, consider what we're talking about here, how would you handle that? Everything, your, all your resources would be overwhelmed. I mean, we're running out of food in our food store and it hasn't, it hasn't anywhere near become to a fraction measurable of what going to happen. This is just the beginning judgment. I mean, there's a series of seven, three sevens going to follow here. Uh, come over to chapter nine. Uh, chapter nine. Uh, we're moving along. Uh, again, we've studied Revelation so you can get uh, picked up the information. Verse 13. The sixth angel sounded. I heard a voice from the four horns of the altar. So another judgment. You know, we go from seals to trumpets to bowls. Every time a seal's opened, you have a series of judgments. Every time a trumpet sounds, it brings forth judgment. Every time a bowl is turned over on the earth, it's like a bowl of super zero. It's pouring out a judgment on the earth. Here you have a trumpet sound. Look at verse 15. The four angels have been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year. You see God's sovereignty? Down to the day. You say, boy, the chaos and the confusion going on in the world. Look at our government. I mean, everybody out for this and that. And, you know, who's telling us? And you got a world going on. And God's ordained down to the year, the hour, the month, the day, not just generally, it'll happen sometime between 2025 and 2030. It's not the way God plans. It will be that year, it will be that month, it'll be that day, it will be that hour. I mean, this is God's sovereign. That's his operation. Now that's true on this, that tells you what's true. This virus has hit the United States that year, that month, that day, that hour. Oh. Well, you know, nobody has control over that. We don't know. We don't have the measuring equipment. Um, God doesn't need measuring equipment. He's omniscient. And he has planned it all. But you know what's going to happen? The end of verse 15. They will kill a third of mankind. Now, wait a minute. We're getting around half the world's population. I've only read you about two of the judgments, the fourth seal and the sixth trumpet. Uh, what's the world going to be like? It's become uninhabitable. I mean, where are you going to get food? Um, and then we saw in Revelation 13... You know, this, I think the only way I can understand this, and keep in mind, this is me understanding it, finiteness multiplied, um, that there are parts of the world, particularly where the Antichrist is most powerful, that are not being effective. That only strengthens his power. What do you think would happen in the United States or happen in the world, say, if Russia collapsed and the United States went out and there was only China. You think they'd be moaning about the loss of the United States? They roll that around. So if the United States goes under, you know, they're protecting us older people. I appreciate that. Um, you know, and uh, they give us things and that's great. But you know, we're going out. We'll leave the $50 trillion debt or whatever to the next generation and... Uh, Lord bless them. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. Will the United States recover? Oh, yes, we are a resilient people. We will recover. Maybe. Maybe this is the beginning of the end for our country. 
And maybe we won't recover. That's a terrible pessimistic thing to say. Well, I don't find the United States in scripture, do you? I find the revived Roman Empire. Well, we try to fit ourselves. Maybe we can be the ones who fit in this way. Maybe we will, I don't know. But it's, no hard, it's not so hard to see that this all of a sudden could go the other way and the virus could turn so fatal we have leaders of our country dying. And then we'd have our hands full. If it's not affecting China, I'm just using them since uh, obviously they're moving for power. You think they're going to say, we've got to do all we can to rescue them. Um, I don't know. The Lord's ordained it. So these judgments, preliminary, we want to recognize it. Come back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Jesus is talking about this same time period. The tribulation. What will happen leading up to his second coming to earth. So that seven year period after the rapture and before he returns to earth. And he goes on to talk about there'll be wars going on. We haven't even gotten into that. Uh, the question to be answered in chapter 24 is in verse 3. His disciples tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Um, they know nothing about the church. So they're talking about it as Jews looking forward to his coming to establish his kingdom. He breaks the tribulation down into two periods. The first half, the second half, which he calls the beginning of birth pangs and then the severity of the pains, which will be the last half of the seven years. And the Jews will be hated by everyone. You can see that anti-Semitism constantly bubbling up. And as well, any believer in Jesus Christ who has come a Gentile who's become a believer after the rapture of the church, which will be fewer because this is the time where Gentiles and, uh, are experiencing salvation. You'll be hated by all nations because of my name. The Jews will have no place to go. That'll be universal. And... Uh, Verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, then you better get out of town telling the Jews because persecution is going to break out like has never happened on the face of the earth. Um, verse 21, then there will be great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world. And if Christ doesn't intervene at the end of that seven-year period, no one would survive um, because it's being overwhelmed and it continues to spread. Now the devil, the plan of God evidently, is able to protect that revived empire in its limited form because right up till the day Christ comes, verse 36, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. They did not understand until the flood came and swept them all away. So it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. People are going to be about. They'll be out in the field. They'll be doing things. This is the second coming of Christ to earth. Uh... Well, wait a minute, how's anybody leading a normal life? Well, I remember in that revived uh, empire, you know, it's not a thing. We feel bad that people in Africa are starving. Uh, I remember one of my good friends is pastoring. We were having a conversation about this years ago. He doesn't live in the area now. We were talking about it and it came up. Well, all these people starving in the world. He says, oh, name me one. Well, I mean, just all those people. Okay, can we go to lunch? I mean, you know, we go on with our life. It's too bad people are suffering in the world. Uh, even believers, I feel bad believers are being imprisoned in China. I mean, there's little or nothing I can do about that. I have to live my life today. And I'm thankful for the grace that is provided 
So I can see in that part of the world, because people are still going to be getting married. Marriages have been canceled because of the virus. Um, can't do it. Can't get together. Can't do it now. Um, but they're going to be going on because if their part of the world is doing good and prospering, it's what we always wanted. We fought world wars for world domination. I mean, you know, Germany, Hitler wanted to dominate the world. He'd do it by military force. If it's a combination of military and famines and pestilences and who cares how it happens? All the Antichrist cares about is power. We've seen that in our country. We're trying to go through it. You get down to it. All anybody cares about is power. If I can just win here and be, in, be ruler, be charge, that's coming to that. Well, who cares about what happens in China? Who cares what happens in Russia? Who cares what happens in the United States? We're self-sufficient. We are overflowing in prosperity. Get out and enjoy life. It's closing in. It will take the coming of Christ to crush the Antichrist. I was not saying that the won't begin to more and more affect more and more. But uh, all this, what we see going on in the world, we don't want to sleep through it, even as believers. We say, well, I'm going to be out in the rapture. Yes. But what Jesus is telling his disciples and warning Jews about who will be in the tribulation because they weren't believers, you ought to have your eyes open and be ready. He's telling, I think, as I look around at the world as a believer today, I think, boy, it's not so hard for me to believe the Lord could come tomorrow. And with that impact on the world and the Lord unleashing judgments, very quickly the world could change dramatically. Our country's changed in months. You have unbelievers sitting there saying, I can't believe this. I would have never believed this could happen. I never would believe our rights would be taken. We would give them up voluntarily. You create such an atmosphere of fear, people do what they're told. We stay home. If you had asked me last year, I would have said there'll be riots in the street. People wouldn't put up with that kind of thing. I don't know how something like that could happen. Now they say stay home, we stay home. Now they say you can buy this, we buy this. Now they say you can't meet as a church. We had a cop car out on our parking lot last week when the few of us who were in here walked out. He was watching the back door. I guess he was watching to make sure we were obeying the rules of numbers and didn't congregate or hug each other. I don't know. He wasn't parked toward 84th. He was parked out just watching the back lot where we come out on the east entrance. Uh, maybe he was having lunch. I didn't stop. But you wonder, you know, we do it. Here we are. I'm speaking to an all but empty auditorium. We could put a couple thousand people here and spread them out. Well, there's other regulations that, and everything goes on. Um, the good thing is we're looking for the rapture. Are we really looking for the rapture? Am I focus really not in this world and caught up with it, or is it really caught up? Christ could come tomorrow. I may be taking losses today, but I haven't lost anything that's of lasting value. I'm not making, minimizing the pain that can come because the Lord might not come for 10 years, 20 years. Um, we don't know. But I'm saying we're to be living like it every day. Remember Paul told the Romans 2,000 years ago, now is your salvation nearer than when you first believed. We don't want to become like those Peter warned about Oh, where's the promise of his coming? I've heard so many sermons on prophecy. Oh, yes, the Lord's coming and he still hasn't come. Well, don't presume on the Lord's patience. Um, these are days of salvation. So what we're about, we want to share the truth. That you can be saved from wrath to come. That's why Jesus Christ came to this earth. Came to provide salvation so he could be your savior. If you'd but turn from your sin and place your faith in him, God says he'll give you a free gift of salvation, good for time and eternity. And we who have, we want to keep our focus on the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your sovereignty, your power. You are the God who rules over all. 
Lord, with our finite, limited minds, it's hard for us to grasp such sovereignty, such greatness, such power, down to the very hour of the day. Um, Lord, you have it all under control. You have appointed it all. Uh, and we belong to you. We are in your care. Uh, we can live confidently and with assurance, not without pain, not without trouble. But Lord, we have the confidence that you will sustain us and keep us. Bless this day. Bless your people, we pray. And bless us as we represent you at this time as we look forward to the coming of the Lord. We pray in his name. Amen.